record. So we're now recording. So I'm going to um, mute um, one last thing as we get started. You are welcome to leave your camera on or turn your camera on, but this is being recorded and it is put on YouTube. Uh, so keep in mind, if you do keep your camera on, you might show up on YouTube. Uh, so keep that in mind. I think everyone has their camera off, but I'm going to turn my camera off now, but I'll be here in the background. Thanks, Audrey. Thank you, Sam. So as Sam said, I'm Audrey Brickley and I'm in ITS. So the best way to reach me is via Six Tech. And my MS is in instructional technology from ECU. And I also earned a graduate certificate in um, online learning and administration while I was there. And I'm working on my MLIS here at UNCG now. And I'm about halfway through that one. And all three of these were or are fully online programs. And so I have kind of experience from all sides, including in my previous life as an instructional designer, where I worked with faculty all day, every day on their online courses. And so the goal for this workshop is for you to be able to describe the community of inquiry framework and use the features of Canvas to create instructor presence in online courses. So we're just going to briefly look at community of inquiry because the main takeaway I want you to have um, from this session is the like concrete strategies that you can do today without a lot of like ramp up or training. So like fairly low effort, but high impact. And some of them will even create some efficiency for you. But I do want to quickly give you the theoretical basis and talk a little bit about the concept of presence in online courses, because it's a term we hear pretty often and it can seem a little bit nebulous or like touchy feely or whatever. So we want to make our uh, make sure our efforts to address it are really hitting the big picture of why this matters. So this framework draws on the concept that inquiry is a social activity that's at the essence of an educational experience. And it applies it to the online learning environment. And I love this representation um, because it just gives us a lot to work with. So the framework kind of shows the relationships between the kinds of presence that we bring to the online classroom and how they contribute to the students' educational experience in our class. And I think I said something to the effect um, in the description of the workshop that the absence of presence <laughs> is, it can feel transactional. And I realize that's kind of a funny thing to say, like the absence of presence, but I think it helps us to conceptualize presence when we stop to think about the impact that the absence of it has. So um, I think it does feel kind of transactional. So you add stuff to Canvas, the student adds stuff to Canvas, you grade it and they get their grade. And even in the case of online discussions, um, often the students are just kind of answering a question to a discussion board, they're trying to get the answer right, and then they get a grade at the end of it. So that, that's something that you know can happen pretty fairly often in the hundreds of online courses that I've looked at. And, um, and so it's not a lot of substantive discourse happening there. So looking at the diagram, there are three kinds of interaction we want students to have in our course with the content, with you, and with each other. So cognitive presence, students are interacting with the content that you've selected or created. They're making meaning, applying concepts, and then social presence, you're building community, you're fostering belonging, um, they're active participants, you're supporting their discourse, so they're expressing themselves and helping each other make connections between the ideas, and they're making meaning together. And of course, teaching presence, um, or it's often called instructor presence, and that's you. <laughs> it's the person behind the course design. And so when we're in the classroom, students know, like it's self-evident that you're the person guiding their learning and designing their learning experiences and creating their assignments and all of that. And that can actually be completely absent in the online classroom if you're not intentional about it. So it's showing yourself and just showing up throughout the semester. It's directing the social and cognitive presence. It's setting the climate and selecting or creating content. It's providing guidance and relevance. And in the asynchronous online classroom, particularly, this doesn't really happen naturally. Um, you know, in the regular classroom, it happens naturally. So I would argue kind of in the synchronous online classroom too, one where we're using um, Zoom for class sessions, it also isn't gonna happen as naturally. And of course, there's definitely some shared responsibility here with cognitive and social presence, like you can lead a horse to water and all of that, but you're directing and guiding and facilitating and showing yourself as the person who's doing all of this. And I love this framework because it is pretty specific, almost like a checklist. So I used to actually keep this tacked up 
um, next to my computer when I was an instructional designer because I used it and referred to it so much. So like a checklist, like, am I doing these things? How am I doing these things? Is it working? And when I was an instructional designer, I will say this is the piece that brought faculty back to my office. So once they implemented changes that we worked on together, you know, they probably like in most cases, they already had content that they loved. They already had assignments that were working pretty well or what have you, but they found that teaching online wasn't really satisfying. So they felt like a grader instead of a teacher. So when I got to work with them on this piece, presence um, in their courses, this is what brought them back to me to thank me and let me know what an impact it had. And one who comes into mind often, um, who actually couldn't stand teaching online before we started working together, he came around to the point where he actually preferred it because of learning to address presence. So I'm always really excited to talk about this. And there are lots of places you can go to read more about this and learn more about it, but I don't wanna go in too deep today because I really wanna focus on the strategies. Um, but this is pretty powerful stuff. And so the research shows it has an impact on student satisfaction, their approach to learning. So Garrison and Cleveland Innes um, described it as leading to deep and meaningful as compared to more of a surface leaning approach over the course of the semester, as well as student motivation and persistence. And then a criticism of the community of inquiry is that it doesn't really address learning outcomes. So it's like, yes, you can do all these things, but if the activities and the content, everything that are, are in the course aren't aligned with the desired learning outcomes, if like if you're showing yourself and students are connecting with you and with each other and everyone's engaged in great discussions, but if students aren't leaving with the skills we're promising them, you know, with the with the learning outcomes that we told them that they would obtain by taking our class, it's kind of wasted effort, if that makes sense. But quality matters totally addresses <laughs> the learning outcomes piece. So extensively. Um, so QMO is a rubric for course design and it doesn't really address delivery. So I like to think of quality matters and community of inquiry as kind of like a happy marriage. And I like to lean on them both really heavily. So, and we do offer quality matters training here at, or workshops here at UNCG and you can find information about those on the workshops calendar. And so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna give you um, five things you can do right now on Canvas using the tools we have available to us here at UNCG. So very concrete. I didn't wanna come here and just tell you that presence is important. <laughs> so I want to give you some ideas about how you can do that pretty easily. And so what I'm going to do is basically like show you the ideas, what they look like in Canvas. Um, and then I I'm not going to go too deep into the nuts and bolts um, because, you know, you may already know how to do all this and, and it's, it'll take some time to show you all that. But I did create a tutorial for each one of the ideas and I added them to a playlist in YouTube. And you can find that at go.uncg.edu slash instructor presence. Um, and so as I walk through each idea now, you can think about which of these, if any, you want to implement. And then if you need it, you can go out to the YouTube playlist and, um, and watch the tutorial. But like, you may not need the how, you might already know how to build a page in Canvas or, or add a video or something like that. So, um, so you can just take these ideas and run with them. But my goal with the YouTube playlist is to kind of meet you where you're at in case you need that, that extra level of the how to. Thank you, Sam, I was just about to add that to the chat. So she did that. Um, and I'm actually gonna stop sharing for a second here because I have everything open um, in my other monitor. So uh, if you guys have any questions um, before I move on to the strategies, sorry, it's taking me a minute to move my chat over and stuff. Um, yeah, so my first one is really just to build a course homepage. And so the idea here, if you remember in the COI model um, was the one of the big pieces was setting climate. And so I like this strategy because it catches that from the very first minute that students enter your online classroom on the first day of the semester. So this also draws really heavily on quality matters. 
um, but also the community of inquiry. So I'm showing myself it. and Quality Matters also recommends a picture. And so one thing I love about online learning is that we can carefully curate this and take the time that we need to make it just right. So like, this is a great picture of me, frankly. <laughs> like I like this picture of me. Whereas would I look this good and calm and welcoming on the first day of semester if I was walking in the classroom? Probably not. <laughs> so this gives us an opportunity to um, really just do this and curate it and make it great um, and make it exactly how we want it. So we get to set that climate for our students and it's just super easy to do. So this took me a few minutes just to create a page. And something I really wanted to show you with this strategy is that you can hit all of these things with the COI and Quality Matters very simply. So of course, you know, you can create a video um, that introduces yourself to your students and introduces the course and walks them through and gives them a tour how to find anything. And that's a great strategy, but this is pretty low effort and it still meets those standards. So it's still doing all those things. It's showing myself, it's setting the climate. I'm giving students the purpose of the course. I'm telling them how to get started. My page is very organized. So I'm giving them a very like intuitive first experience in my course rather than a frustrating one. And I also made some very intentional choices here. So for example, um, for building connection, like the first thing I want them to do when they get to my course is introduce themselves. So I'm really prioritizing connection. So I know a lot of times we start with the syllabus because it's very important and we want students to know our policies. But if we think about setting the climate, like I would say probably the vast majority, maybe like 90% of the online courses I've looked at over the course of my career, start with the syllabus. And so if you think about kind of meeting somebody online, you're kind of applying that tone of voice and all of that to like their writing, right? So I really love this strategy of starting out, like kind of pushing the syllabus down a little bit, give them a minute to get to know me, to see me, to introduce themselves to me, to kind of explore the course before I jump into the syllabus and the policies. And of course it's important, I have my syllabus quiz set up so that they're, you know, they're on the same page as me about what the expectations are, but I'm kind of prioritizing connection, community, a warm climate. But um, the thing to note here is that you need to do you, like this is me, I sign my thing warmly. That's maybe how I want my students to feel in my course. And this is a pretend course, obviously. It's a baking course, which I always use for my examples because it's just like my geeky hobby. Um, and it's not like something that we have at UNCG so people don't get hung up on the content. Um, so I love doing baking for my examples. But um, you know, your discipline might be, I always use the example of business where we're setting a very different kind of tone. Maybe it's not warm and fuzzy, maybe it's very professional. And that's something you can be transparent with here um, in your, in, in your self-introduction. And Quality Matters uses the words professional and approachable. So that's the balance we're trying to strike with this initial self-introduction and your picture and all of that. Um, and then I also include some information about what to do if students have a question um, or if they need help. And, and you can see it, this is just set up very simply. It's like, it gives the experience very organized and like simple and clear. So you can, you know, if you love graphic design, you can feel free to, you know, create whatever kind of um, images you want for your course, but I keep it simple. And I found throughout my, um, throughout my experience working with faculty that keeping it simple works well for them and their students. And I think it's better to do something rather than nothing. And so this really, when you choose your course homepage, there are many options in Canvas. Um, but I just love this one because the other ones aren't gonna allow you to hit those standards in um, Quality Matters course introduction um, section. And it's not going to allow you to set the climate the way this page will. So that's my first tip. And then my next one is very similar. So when I go to modules in my course, I love modules because it really sets up everything very clearly and intuitively. It creates a path for students to follow. And so again, like probably the vast majority of courses that I've looked at over my career kind of have each a weekly format, which works very well, but then it's just kind of like content and assignments, just duh, duh, duh. So my next 
tip is to create a module overview and introduction page. And this is the same kind of thing where I'm, I'm bringing my voice to my course. So it's not just content and assignments. It's me telling students what we're trying to achieve. I'm giving them encouragement. I'm giving some relevance, right? So um, we, when we look at adult learning theory, one of the most important points there is relevance. So we wanna make sure that we're, we're telling students why what we're doing matters. And this happens naturally in the classroom. We stand in front of students and we tell them all of these things. And I just kind of highlighted some stuff, not so much for um, my students. I just was going to show you guys some things that I might say to students in this page. And I always also like to provide a to-do list. So something else that I tend to see is maybe the assumption that because we're in the unit um, for chapter one, that students are reading chapter one. <laughs> That's not necessarily always the case. So I'm just giving them a very clear idea of everything they should do during this module. Again, stuff that happens naturally in the face-to-face -face classroom. Um, I will say as an online student, now that I'm kind of um, in a synchronous program, I find myself relying more on my faculty to like my professors to tell me what's happening, to tell me what's coming next. Whereas in the online learning environment where it's asynchronous and I'm not meeting with my instructor every week, it's like, it's more on me. So getting this guidance from my instructor, I can keep my notes, make sure I'm ticking all the boxes, all of those things. So my next tip is, this is one of my favorite ones, honestly, it's just to create a video walkthrough um, explaining your assignments to your students. So this is pretty simple to do, and I do lay it out in the YouTube tutorial, but basically um, you're not gonna need this for all your assignments. Like you have your assignments where it's like a quiz or it's low stakes, just answering a few questions or something like that, but your big high stakes, maybe your projects, your essays, I'm, I've been made aware that this is a very common question um, in tutoring, writing center, all of that, that students just wanna come in and make sure they understand the assignment. So in an online course, you know, we might give all these instructions to our face-to-face -face students, but something we do with our face-to-face -face students is we talk about it to them, right? We stand in front of them, we tell them why it's important. We lay out the expectations, our tone of voice and all of those things convey what we're looking for. And that can be missing from the online core, the online environment. It can just be like a, like a laundry list of instructions that they're supposed to do. This kind of brings in that piece. It, it shows you what you're, you know, you can explain what you're going to be looking for when you're grading. And in this example video, um, I kind of go over my rubric and all of those things. So I think this is just simple great and it really brings your presence and your guidance to your course for your students. And then my next one is very similar, which is just adding a like a video response to a discussion board. So as I mentioned in the introduction, like sometimes for online discussions, it can be very like answer these questions, reply to two people, back and forth is happening. It can be very difficult to keep up with all of that. Um, you know, as the week progresses and make sure you're getting in there and, and responding to students because things happen. <laughs> and this is one of my most memorable experiences from my first, um, my first master's degree fully online. I had this back and forth with another student, like the discussion board was about, it was like, learning theory. We had all these learning theories that we were learning and we had to give real world examples of how it plays out in the classroom. And so I'm having this back and forth with one of my peers in my course and we were disagreeing about what, you know, respectfully and all that, but like we were trying to figure out like who's right. Is it this or is it that? The instructor never came in and clarified for us <laughs> who was right or if either of us were right, if we had misconceptions, we just got a grade at the end. And that made a huge imprint on me. And I see this very frequently. I experience it very frequently as a student. Discussions in online courses can feel forced. It's not that, um, it's not that substantive discourse that we're really looking for, but at the same time, it can be really hard. I completely acknowledge that it can be really hard to get in there, keep up with it. But when it does come time for you maybe to respond to students, create like a video response to students. I think this is a great strategy. It shows yourself, um, shows your face, gives your voice. 
and gives you an opportunity to kind of quickly and conveniently and efficiently address what you've seen happening in the discussion board. So maybe you let students know on the last day of discussion, I'm going to post my thoughts in a video. And you can simply do this just by hitting reply in your own discussion board. And you can look for studio, which is often behind this apps button, which looks like a little plug. And this will give you, and I'm, I have some terrible thumbnails here. I will just admit when I was creating my little practice videos, <laughs> but you can record a webcam video and it's not gonna pick up my webcam probably because Zoom is using it. Um, just to simply start recording, it's very straightforward. It's not a difficult thing to do. And, and it's quick and easy for you to come in here and do this versus trying to attack every little misconception that you see as you're um, reading through the student's discussion prompts. I mean, answers. Okay, and then I have one more and this is the easiest one and also um, a great one and it's, video or audio comments in SpeedGrader. And so this, again, super easy to do. I'm actually gonna turn off my camera and zoom so I can show you what this looks like. Um, okay, so um, when you go into SpeedGrader for any assignment, any submission, any student, um, you'll see that we have this option here to add a comment and we can add a text-based comment but it comes back to that thing of reading tone. So often um, with, with text-based writing, it comes off maybe not ha exactly how we intended. And I think that's especially true for feedback. So as a student, again, I've been a, an online student for uh, like six years, the last six years now, getting feedback is kind of terrifying. So if you can add your voice or even your face to a media comment in SpeedGrader, I think that goes a long way to kind of softening that feedback, letting them know, you know, things that they did well, things that maybe you could improve on. Um, and it's so simple. You just look for this media comment button and then it's gonna bring up your webcam and you can just start recording. And I'll just show you real quick, like for me, it brought up my webcam, um, but if you don't see your webcam, you can just look like I have an integrated webcam in my laptop, which is closed right now. So if it's like, if your webcam's not showing, you just can click this to get more options, or you could just click no video and leave audio feedback. So if you do it this way, you know, you'll be, you'll get that confirmation that it's recording um, by simply seeing this blue bar going up and down. But if you want to include that, um, that webcam, you can just do that and then click start recording. Gives me that countdown. And then I just speak to my students. I, I give them some encouragement. I share my tone of voice so that the feedback isn't quite so scary. I click finish and then save. And it adds that media comment to SpeedGrader. And let's just go back, let's go into um, student view. So I can just show you what it looks like from the student perspective. And this is also just one of my favorite general Canvas tips is to use student view often. And we can do everything with test student. So we can, um, you know, we can submit assignments, grade them, see what it all looks and feels like from the student perspective. So when I go to grades, I see that I have a comment here and I'll be able to see these media comments and play them play those video comments. So I think that's just a super simple, quick, it'll add some efficiency for you. Let me start my, my um, webcam again, but it'll add some efficiency for you as you're grading. Cause often, I'm, and I will admit it's hard to get started with this because when we're teaching in the classroom, we don't have to watch ourselves <laughs> or hear our voices, but the more you do it, the easier that part gets. And you'll be like dropping these videos, like it's nothing and it'll create a lot of efficiency for you. So those are my strategies. And again, um, we have that YouTube playlist. If you wanna learn specifically how to accomplish any of them, I walk through like how to create a page, make sure it's accessible, all of those things on, on the YouTube playlist. But that's really it. That's, I think I did pretty good on time and we have just a few minutes left for questions if you guys have them. Yes, so now is a great time to ask questions. I learned some stuff. Okay. <laughs> Jane online. I thought that was really good. Good, thank you. Was that helpful for everyone else?
what about us as a student? So are you asking if students can reply to their instructor via video? The answer is yes, in discussion board. So you could create a fully discussion, a fully video-based discussion board if you wanna add that level of presence to your course, but not in SpeedGrader. So in SpeedGrader, no, um, they don't have that option to add a, a media comment. You're welcome. I'm so glad you all came. Thank you so much for, for spending some time on this this morning. Yeah, I think it's useful that you have experience as an instructional designer, a student, and uh, a uh, instructor. Yeah, it definitely helps to see it from all sides because like when I only was an instructional designer, I, I was told a few times that I was too idealistic. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So I've let that go a little bit the more I teach. <laughs> So I dropped um, a link to a quick assessment in the um, chat to let us know how uh, we did. And then um, also there's a link here to the online learning um, webinar series. Uh, there was an addition of one added on to this um, as well that you can see. And I'm just waiting for a little bit more information, but you can get the basic gist in that November 9th at 1 p.m. We have one on web accessibility 101 on the level one course it's an asynchronous course that everyone teaching online will be required to take it'll be hosted by our uncg online accessibility coordinator i think is her title and um uh so be sure to come out or sign up if you can't come live we'll send you the recording um i'm excited to uh to learn more about the class to take the class um, so keep that in mind. So are there any final questions, concerns, um, anything else before we go? And the sign up for that is on the, um, you, in, you know, that uh, link to the webinar page here as well. So keep that in mind. So great. So yeah, thank you everyone. Uh, the timing was great, Audrey, right? Yes. <laughs> right below 30 minutes. So I hope everyone has a great day and uh, see many of you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.